Come along, take a trip to the past. We've got places to explore. Come along, take a trip to the past to learn about things you never knew before. Field trips to yesterday. Field trips to yesterday. Field trips to yesterday. Come along, we're on our way. Philadelphia, the birthplace of the United States. In this program, we'll visit some of Philadelphia's many historic places and talk to a man who dresses and speaks just like Benjamin Franklin, Philadelphia's leading citizen. He'll talk to us about many of the places and people who helped create the United States. Let's begin our visit to Philadelphia by going back in time to the 1760s, before the American Revolution when the 13 original colonies that became the United States of America were ruled by England. Even though each colony was separate and independent, they all had similar complaints about King George III and the government in England. The colonists wanted more of a say in how they were governed, and the English wanted to keep control. England kept passing laws that the colonists thought were unfair. Among the laws they resented most were the Quartering Acts of 1765 and 1766. These laws said that the colonists had to let British soldiers live in their taverns, inns, and unoccupied buildings without paying anything. Then, in 1774, the British added ordinary citizens' homes to the list. That was the last straw. The colonists had had enough. Many colonial leaders wanted to meet and discuss what they could do together to settle their problems with England. So, on September 5th, 1774, delegates from every colony, except Georgia, came to Philadelphia for the first Continental Congress. We asked Benjamin Franklin why Philadelphia was chosen as the meeting place. Philadelphia was the biggest city in America, a busy city, a bustling city. It seemed to be the center of commerce for our new nation, or what we hoped would be our new nation. And so, having just completed a wonderful meeting hall, Carpenter's Hall here in Philadelphia, we had not only the space, but the accommodations, the inns, and the travel would be easier. The First Continental Congress met here, at Carpenter's Hall. Carpenter's Hall belonged to the Carpenter's Company, a group of architects and craftsmen. Inside this building, the delegates to the First Continental Congress discussed many of the grievances the colonists had against England. Of course, the delegates also needed a place to sleep and eat while they were in Philadelphia. Many of them stayed at the City Tavern. The City Tavern wasn't a formal meeting place, like Carpenter's Hall, but it soon became a center of political and social importance. Delegates like George Washington and Patrick Henry of Virginia and John Adams of Massachusetts held discussions and debates here about how to deal with the British. These talks laid the groundwork for the American Revolution. Benjamin Franklin wasn't a delegate to the First Continental Congress. He was in England at the time, acting as an agent for the colonists and trying to deal with many of the same issues the delegates were discussing back home in Philadelphia. One of the most important issues was the question of taxation. The British had passed a number of bills in Parliament that placed taxes on the colonists. The colonists believed that Parliament did not have that right. They said they could not be taxed without the approval of their own colonial assemblies. No taxation without representation became a rallying cry of the colonists. Well, everyone seems to be familiar with the taxation and representation problems we had, but there was a bigger problem. And that problem was respect. We wanted to be treated as British subjects would be treated in London, for instance. Uh, men and women who should be listened to, should have a, a say in their government, and should be treated as individuals, not as children. Before the First Continental Congress adjourned, the delegates wrote a petition to the king, which demanded their rights and liberties as Englishmen. 
and they pledged to meet again the following May if the king did not agree to their demands. By the spring of 1775, it was clear that the king had no intention of listening to the Americans. Then, the problems between the colonists and the English turned to open rebellion. In April 1775, British troops marched from Boston, Massachusetts. On April 19th, 70 militia men faced 700 British redcoats at Lexington. Then, the British marched five miles to Concord, where more colonials awaited them. The revolution had begun. In May, the fighting moved to Fort Ticonderoga in New York. The fort was captured from the British by a band of New England militiamen led by Ethan Allen of Vermont and Benedict Arnold of Connecticut. On the same day that Fort Ticonderoga was captured, the Second Continental Congress was meeting, again in Philadelphia. This time, the Congress was held here. It was called the Pennsylvania State House then. Today, it's called Independence Hall. One of the first issues the delegates had to deal with was who now owned Fort Ticonderoga. Did it belong to the colonies who captured it, or did it belong to New York where it was located? No one really knew because no one was really in charge of the rebellion against the British. Delegate John Adams came up with a plan. He thought the time had come to establish a grand American army made up of all the colonies. To lead the army, he nominated... A gentleman whose skills as an officer, whose independent fortune, great talents, and universal character would command the respect of America and unite the full exertions of the colonies better than any other person alive. He was talking about George Washington of Virginia. After a few days of debate, Congress announced the order. To inform George Washington of the unanimous vote in choosing him to be general and commander-in-chief of the forces raised and or be raised in defense of American liberty. Well, George Washington was a, a good choice to have the army. He, of course, had the military background, but he also had the loyalty of the soldiers, which was very important. He was a leader who was not perfect, a leader who had made many mistakes, but had always learned from those mistakes. He'd always picked himself up and gone on. Uh, so here was a man who was capable of handling adversity as well as the success. It's important to understand that establishing the army didn't mean that all the delegates were in favor of separating from England, but many were. Benjamin Franklin, who represented Pennsylvania at the Second Continental Congress, explains why so many Americans wanted to establish a country of their own. I think what made Americans have the desire for freedom and independence was the fact that we were in this nation isolated from the mother country, from England, from Great Britain. And the people who came here had a pioneering spirit. We were people who came here with a sense of adventure. People who wanted to build something for, for our, our children and our grandchildren. And of course, that naturally led to a, a feeling of independence. In January 1776, a pamphlet was published in Philadelphia that changed the minds of many who were against separation. It was called Common Sense, and it was written by Thomas Paine. Paine was born in England and had come to America under the sponsorship of Benjamin Franklin. Ah, yes, Thomas Paine. I met him over there in London, and he was quite an interesting man. He seemed to have the fire of revolution in his belly, and he was a good writer. I encouraged him to come to America. He could aid our cause. By the spring of 1776, more and more people became convinced that there was no way to settle the differences with England. On June 7th, Richard Henry Lee, a delegate from Virginia, offered this resolution in Congress. These united colonies are, and of right, ought to be free and independent states. After some debate, a committee was appointed to write a document explaining why the colonists wanted their independence. The committee included Thomas Jefferson of Virginia, Robert Livingston of New York, 
John Adams of Massachusetts, Roger Sherman of Connecticut, and Benjamin Franklin. Well, well, we were on a committee, you know, how committees are. There were five of us on the committee, and someone had to do the writing. I said I would write it because, after all, I've been a journalist all my life. I, I've been writing things since I was a young boy. And then there was John Adams on the committee. John, well, you know, John was not always well-liked. He could be a bit uh, stubborn and obnoxious sometimes, and it would never pass. But then there was Thomas Jefferson. In this house, owned by a young German bricklayer, Jacob Graff, Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence. Working alone in the second floor parlor, Jefferson told the world why America no longer wanted to be a part of England. On June 28, 1776, at Independence Hall, Congress reviewed Jefferson's draft. Now we needed the support of the South, and of course he was from Virginia. Uh, he was a good writer, which certainly was a very important factor. Uh, he also was very brilliant, I think by far the most brilliant of the members of our Second Continental Congress. And he also was young, and he didn't realize what was going to happen. We were going to take his document and change it, and change it, and change it, and change it, until finally he seemed a little upset. Uh, he said something about ruining it, but I think he finally realized that the changes were necessary, if for no other reason than to make each one of us a part of that document so that when 56 of us pledged our lives and our fortunes and, and our sacred honor in signing it, it would be a promise for the future, to future generations of this nation, that we would have a free and independent nation. Finally, on July 4th, 1776, the Second Continental Congress voted unanimously to separate from England. The United States of America was born. On July 8th, bells rang out and the citizens of Philadelphia gathered at Independence Hall to hear the reading of the Declaration of Independence. The bell that rang came to be known as the Liberty Bell. It was originally made to commemorate the 50th anniversary of Pennsylvania's charter. The bell was cast in England and came to Philadelphia in 1752, but when it was tested, it cracked. Then, two workmen, John Pass and John Stowe, their names appear on the bell, offered to recast it. When they finished, it was hung in a tower atop the Pennsylvania State House, and that's where it rang out on July 8, 1776. The bell cracked again, but no one is really sure when. The Liberty Bell no longer hangs in the tower above Independence Hall. Today, it has its own special place in Philadelphia. The colonies declared their independence on July 4th, but the war went on for five more years. Finally, in October 1781, the British commander, General Cornwallis, surrendered to the Americans at Yorktown in Virginia. Now the leaders who had worked for independence were faced with the job of establishing a government for the new country. The first attempt, called the Articles of Confederation, wasn't satisfactory. So once again, the delegates came to Philadelphia to work out a solution. This time, the delegates could proudly say they came from states, not colonies. On May 25, 1787, in Independence Hall, 55 delegates sitting in these Windsor chairs around these green cloth tables, began the task of creating a new government for the new nation. The meeting came to be known as the Constitutional Convention. Among the most important contributors to the writing of the Constitution were James Wilson and Gouverneur Morris of Pennsylvania, Roger Sherman and Oliver Ellsworth of Connecticut, Alexander Hamilton of New York, and James Madison of Virginia. Madison is often called the father of the Constitution because his contribution was so great. This is the chair where the president of the Constitutional Convention, George Washington, sat. Notice the engraving of the sun. On the back of that chair there was carved a sun. Artists in their craft 
have found it difficult to depict between a rising and the setting sun. And there were times when that sun seemed to be sinking lower and lower because we couldn't agree upon much of anything. Uh, but gradually I came to know that that sun indeed was a rising sun and not a setting sun. The delegates worked throughout the grueling, hot summer of 1787. They argued and debated and compromised. Finally, they produced the government that we know today. It is the first republic of the people, by the people, and for the people in the history of the world. After the Constitution was ratified, that is, approved by the 13 states, Congress voted to make Philadelphia the nation's capital, but only temporarily. They planned a new capital city on land that didn't belong to any one state. President George Washington selected the site himself. So, from 1790 until 1800, while the new capital city, Washington, D.C., was being built, Philadelphia served as the nation's capital. Here at Congress Hall is where the first Congress met. Congress is made up of two houses, the Senate, or Upper House, and the House of Representatives, or the Lower House. The House of Representatives met on the first floor. According to the Constitution, the number of representatives each state is entitled to depends on the population of that state. There were 64 members in the first House of Representatives. Today, there are 435 members. The Senate met on the second floor. Every state, regardless of size, has two senators. So, the first Senate that met in this chamber had 26 members. Today, there are 100 senators. Probably the most important business of the first Congress was the adoption of the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. The amendments list specific rights all Americans have, such as free speech, a free press, freedom of religion, and the guarantee that in times of peace, citizens will never be forced to take soldiers into their homes. Congress Hall is also the place where George Washington was inaugurated for his second term as president and where he made his farewell address. It was also the place of the peaceful transition of power from Washington to John Adams, the second president of the United States. This building, Philadelphia City Hall, now called the Old City Hall, was the first home of the Supreme Court of the United States. Another famous Philadelphia landmark from the earliest days of the Republic is this building, the first bank of the United States. It's believed to be the country's oldest bank building. Congress established the bank to give the new nation a strong banking system. There's one more place we would like to visit before we leave. Tradition says that this house is where Betsy Ross lived and where she made the first American flag. According to legend, she made it from a design given to her by George Washington. No one knows that that's really true, but it has become part of the story of America and part of the history of Philadelphia, the city known as the birthplace of the nation.